Hi, this is Sir Jet, and welcome to another episode of the History Lectures. Today we have a very interesting lesson. It's about the history of the Bangsa Moro people, the Sultanate of Sulu, and the indigenous people of the Philippines. Now, this lesson is required by CHED to be taught to all college students and inserted in the course Readings in Philippine History. Aside from the Constitution topic, which CHED also asked us to insert in our course, this is also required by the government. Why? Because you will see later on how important this lesson is for you to learn. Alright, so let me tell you a story first. When I was in college, um, we don't have online registration yet. So we used to line up at the site okay, and uh, fill up forms. Now I have a batchmate who was uh, lining up with me. And uh, in the form that we need to fill up, it says their nationality. Of course, I would write there Filipino. But you know what? My batchmate didn't write Filipino. He write Moro. And uh, he looked pretty much uh, Filipino like me. And I found out that his father was a high-ranking official of the MNLF at that time. You know, the university where I studied, it's uh, quite um, uh, diverse. You know, you meet classmates from all over the Philippines. And so, uh, I learned that there are people in our country who wouldn't call themselves Filipino and uh, they would call themselves uh, Moro or Bangsa Moro. Now, this lesson is important so that we can understand where they are coming from in their opinion. Okay? And, uh, and for us to relate properly to them. And uh, how can we have peace and harmony in our archipelago that has a very diverse group of citizens and inhabitants, you know? So, this lesson, um, I hope, okay, will uh, make our country more united by uh, you and me trying to see our brothers and sisters Okay, on uh, on a uh, point of view that uh, there is love and uh, peace. Okay, the the aspiration that we will have national unity. That is the objective of this lesson. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so let's talk about the Bangsa Moro first before the other topics, subtopics. Let us uh, go back to the pre-colonial times. You know, in the Chronicles of Pigafetta, the, that's the companion of Magellan, if you remember, uh, he wrote about the kingdoms that they met in the Philippines. So, of course, you read already that they met the, the uh, king of Masawa, the king of Cebu, and then after that uh, episode, that group continued on sailing in our archipelago and they met more kingdoms. So if you're interested to read the rest of Pigafetta's chronicles, you just go to the internet and uh, search for it. It's very interesting how uh, their group met the people of Palawan, Saba, Sulu, Basilan, and other parts of Mindanao. Very interesting. Now, in the Pigafetta's Chronicles, he classified the uh, people he met as either Moro or Heathen. He would call the Moro kingdoms uh, such okay, if the people there were uh, Muslims. And uh, if they were non-Muslims, he would call those kingdoms or those people Heathen. Heathen is another word for pagan. Uh, it's quite a derogatory word, okay, but that's what Pigafetta used to refer to the non-Muslims. 
Now, actually, the non-Muslims, technically, their religion is called animism. Okay? The belief in the many anitos. So, the uh, heathen believe in many gods, while the Muslims believe in just one god, who is Allah. During Pigafetta's time, the islands of the Philippines were either Moro or animistic. Now, when did uh, Islam enter our shores? So, Islam first arrived in uh, the island of Sulu and then later to the island of Mindanao around 100 years before the arrival of Magellan. So, it's not really very, very uh, long time before Magellan. It's quite near the arrival of Magellan, 150 years. And the first Muslim preacher, we have a name, okay? His name is Mudum, okay? He doesn't have a family name. Many people uh, say that his family name is Aurin or Aurin. No, no family name, just Mudum. And uh, he is uh, from Arabia. Okay, so that's the birthplace of the Islam religion. So when when he arrived in Sulu, because uh, Sulu is a big uh, marketplace, and uh, he's also a trader, and aside from uh, his merchandise, he also uh, shared to the people of Sulu his faith. And so the people of Sulu accepted Islam as their religion, and it's uh, fast spreading. It uh, also spread to Mindanao, the island of Mindanao. Now, the other Muslim preachers followed after Mudum. And uh, we have names for them also. Abu Bakar, Sharif Kabungsuan, and Raha Baginda. And they come from nearby islands here in Southeast Asia. The islands of Indonesia and uh, from mainland uh, Malaysia. They taught Islam to the people of Sulu and also Mindanao. Now, from southern Philippines, the doctrine of Islam sp spread next to the Visayas and then up to Luzon. So that's uh, in the next 150 years, from 1380 to 1521. That's why when Magellan and Pigafetta arrived here in 1521 in the Visayas, Okay. They, were, they also encountered some barangays or kingdoms who adhere to Islam. And uh, when Legaspi arrived uh, 50 years later, he also found uh, Islamic communities in Luzon. As you can see, had not the Spaniards arrived to uh, Christianize the islands, maybe the whole Philippines today would be a Muslim country, just like our neighbors, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei. But that's not how the cookie crumbled. The Spaniards came and they conquered Visayas and Luzon. The native kingdoms there were converted to Catholicism. So their religion, before the coming of Magellan, they gave that up, animism, and they converted to Catholicism. Take note that it's only Visayas and Luzon. Mindanao was untouched. The Spaniards were not able to conquer Mindanao and Sulu Archipelago. So technically, Las Islas Filipinas, which is part of the Spanish Empire, was just Luzon and Visayas. A few parts of Mindanao fell to the hands of the Spaniards, like Zamboanga City, okay, they speak Chabacano, uh, Dapitan, where Rizal was exiled, Cagayan de Oro, the name itself is Spanish, and Davao. But these places are just dots on the map. But the big, big part of Mindanao, especially the interior of Mindanao, and uh, the islands near Mindanao, like the Sulu group of islands, were free from Spanish control. And they were Islamic in religion. And that's the situation for the 300 years plus 
of Spanish rule in the Philippines. The Moros were successful in maintaining their independence from Spain. Now, there were waves of invasions coming from uh, the Spaniards, and we call them the Moro Wars. So, there were seven waves in all. Seven Moro Wars. Not Star Wars, uh, but Moro Wars. And all of these uh, Moro Wars, uh, the Spaniards lost. You don't read this too much or too often in history books. It's just now that uh, we are including this in the study of history. The Moro Wars. There were Filipinos then who were non-Catholic. Only the Visayans and the Luzon people were Catholic. The Moros were the non-Catholic Filipinos. That's uh, what the Spaniards call them, Moro. That's what they call themselves also, because that's what they hear from the Spaniards. They, they call us Moro, so, okay, we are Moro. And uh, they were able to preserve their culture, preserve their religion. Their clothes, as you can see, their weapons, their way of life is pretty much the same, just like what they do during pre-colonial times. Meanwhile, their brothers and sisters in Luzon and Visayas became Hispanized got dressed with uh, Spanish clothes, lived in uh, Spanish-designed uh, houses and towns, and uh, learned a new religion and a language also that is from the colonizers. Now, aside from the Moro, there are also other non-Catholic Filipinos, particularly in the interior of Luzon and interior of other large islands deep in the mountains the Spaniards really couldn't uh, have their foothold and conquer the people deep in the mountains so in Luzon that's that mountain region I'm talking about is the Cordillera uh, region so if you know the provinces of uh, Kalinga Apayao, Ifugao, okay, Benguet so those places were pretty much untouched by the Spaniards for 300 years. So the people there were able to preserve their indigenous culture. And these are the uh, Ifugaos and other Cordilleran people. The Aitas, the Dumagats, we call them Negritos. They also live in the interior mountains of Luzon. In Quezon, in Zambales, that's uh, their ancestral lands. Up to today, eh, as you can see, they still play their traditional clothes. So, technically, we call these non-Hispanized Filipinos as indigenous people, or IP. Okay, so you might uh, read some materials which says IP. So, it means indigenous people. Now, aside from the ones I've mentioned, IP people from Luzon, there are also IP people in Mindoro, the Mangyans. Okay, and then in Palawan, we call them the Tagbanwa. And in Mindanao, there are also IP, and we call them Lumads. It's a general term, Lumads. And the Lumads are actually a group of, or a group of many other tribes that are non-Muslim and non-Catholic. In Mindanao, it's quite diverse. They have Muslims, they have the Christians, and then they have the Lumads. And then among the Lumads, you can further divide it some more because uh, the Lumad is like an umbrella term. And the specific tribes uh, that are Lumads are the Ata, Bagobo, Banwaon, Blaan, the Bukidnon tribe, the Babawon, Higaunon, Mamanwa, Mandaya, Manguwangan, Manobo, Mansaka, Subanon, Tagakaulo, Tiboli, the Durai and Ubo, and there may be more. They lived in the mountain without being uh, conquered by the Spaniards. And uh, they were also separate from the Muslim communities because they are not Muslims. Their religion is the old religion of our ancestors before the coming of the Spaniards. Probably they have uh, rituals for the Anitos. And it's a very interesting topic, the IP. Some people pursue studies on IP, eh? like the anthropologists. Now, the IP up to today, very interestingly, eh? 
they preserve their culture, traditions, ancestral lands, and also the lineage of Datus. So you may have a classmate and, and he would introduce himself, I'm a Datu, or I'm the crown prince of uh, a certain Lumad tribe. So this guy over here is a Datu. So there are modern day Datus. They, they preserve uh, their lineage, the royal line. So father will uh, give the title to his son, and the son will give the title to his son. And, and up to today, the passing of the title Datu lives on. Very interesting. You can have further research, research on this, the IP people. Now let's go back to what happened to the uh, Muslim people of Mindanao. They uh, were not conquered by the Spaniards for 333 years. Now the Americans came after the Spanish Empire. We all know that. The Treaty of Paris sold the Philippines from Spanish hands to American hands. And when the Americans came here, they took over the colony of Spain, which uh, they declared in the treaty as Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao. The funny thing is that Mindanao was not really fully controlled by the Spaniards, but they included it in the sale. So they sold something that they don't really have, that they can't really handle. So it's like having a pet crocodile in your house and uh, you sold your house together with the pet crocodile that you cannot handle and it's up to the next owner to take over your house and to take over your pet crocodile. The Americans, what they have to do, so they got Luzon Visayas and then Mindanao was a challenge for them, how to really subdue Mindanao. Their uh, solution was to befriend the Sultan of Sulu. Sulu was the largest Muslim community then, or the most prominent and the strongest one. So they sent a uh, general named uh, General John Bates. And he made friends with the Sultan of Sulu and made him sign a treaty called the Bates Treaty. Now, what does the Bates Treaty say? The Americans told the Sultan of Sulu, let's uh, have a deal. I will give you a piece of cloth and you just have to put this piece of cloth on a bamboo pole and erect that pole with that uh, cloth in your land. Put that cloth also, we will have several of those cloth and put them on the ships that would uh, sail in your waters. And if the ship would have that cloth, they are exempted from taxes. But if they don't have that cloth, they will be charged with taxes. And as for you, for, f for flying that cloth on the pole in your land and in all the other barangays of the datus under you, you will have money for doing that. Of course, if that's the deal, if you're the Sultan, you would say, Oh, deal, I like that. I'll have money by just uh, flying this cloth. The ships that don't cooperate, I will get taxes from them. Amazing. So the Sultan agreed. And the cloth, what's the color? Red, white, and blue with stars and stripes. The American flag. So technically, the treaty is saying that we will erect the American flag on your land. And you are now American territory. And the Sultan agreed. Part of the deal is that you will still be Sultan. But... Uh, you will only be sultan on matters regarding religion, religious leadership. That's yours. We don't want that. But for administrative leadership, we'll take care of that. We will administer the land. But religion, it's yours. So the sultan said, okay, that's a nice deal. And that's the base treaty. As easy as that, Mindanao came under... American administrative control. That's something that the Spaniards were not able to do in 300 years. The Americans were able to do it just a snap. Okay, now sooner or later, the uh, Sultan of Sulu figured out that he has been tricked. And so a war broke out in 1902. 
It's called the Moro American War. So the Muslims started now to fight for their independence because they uh, figured out that the Americans are now the ones in control administratively in their land. So they fought a very bloody war. It's called the Moro American War. And uh, the firepower of the Americans were so strong, they were the strongest nation in the world at that time, leader also in science and technology, so they were able to invent guns. You see the pistol here that he's holding, a 45 caliber pistol was invented for the Moro American War because it has 13 bullets. Bang, 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 bang. Okay? And while the old style guns of the Spaniards is just isang kasa, isang putok. A more uh, modern uh, gun would be the six-shooter revolver, which only has uh, six bullets. You know, the cowboy pistol. But uh, the 45 caliber pistol has 13 bullets, more than double the six-shooter pistol. That's key in uh, subduing the um, Muslims in the Moro American War. This is a very tragic war because uh, many were massacred. It's a forgotten war. Nobody wants to write about this or talk about this. The Budao massacre. Look at the picture. See? Men, women, children. There are around 600 died in a single day in a single battle. They were dumped in that uh, ditch. I think some of them were even raped because uh, one picture there of a woman is topless. That's called the Budaho Massacre, which happened in the crater of this extinct volcano. The women and the children hid there, thinking that they would be safe. But the Americans uh, mercilessly attacked and defeated, killed all the Muslims hiding in the Budaho crater. This picture was shown by President Duterte to the media in 2016, saying, uh, I'm not a big fan of the U.S. You know what they did in my uh, home uh, place in Mindanao, the Budaho Massacre, and then he showed the media this picture. Here are more pictures of the Moro American War. It's a long war which ended in 1915 with the Kiram Carpenter Agreement. Kiram is the Sultan of the Muslims, and then uh, Carpenter is the American counterpart who signed the agreement, saying that America would now take control of the Moro lands and they would be under American laws. And that's the end of uh, Moro independence in uh, our history. They became a subdued people just like the Visayans and the Luzon people. You know, the uh, Moro people, they have a lot of pride looking at their fellow Visayans and Luzonians. Why? Because they say, yeah, uh, we're the stronger Filipino, or we're the stronger race or people. Because we were never conquered by the Spaniards. You were conquered. We are not conquered. So it makes sense. Okay? They have something really to be proud of. While uh, we, Luzon and the Visayan peoples, were under the Spaniards for 333 years, they were a free people. It's just during the American colonial period that all of us became a subdued, colonized people. Now, towards the end of the American colonial period, it was the Commonwealth period. And that's the time when uh, the Americans taught the Filipinos self-rule. We had a president in training, vice president, and also lawmakers, okay, senators, training for independence. Now, two of those uh, senators who were being trained by the Americans on how to make laws, Quirino and Recto, Pidio Quirino and Claro M. Recto. And the uh, one law that they made during the Commonwealth period was the Mindanao Colonization Bill. You now, what is this all about? It says that uh, the people of Visayas and Luzon can go and have their lands granted to them in Mindanao. Now, the Moro people, you know, they, they are not really an agricultural people. They don't love uh, planting the fields with crops. They are more of a merchandising people. They love selling. So they sell everything. They sell and sell. That has been their job or their uh, lifestyle ever since, even before the coming of the Spaniards. 
That's what they do. So the soil in Mindanao was pretty much idle. Nobody tills the soil. Nobody's a farmer who is a native of uh, Mindanao. They, they don't really uh, till the soil. So Kirina and Recto said that uh, Mindanao is the land of promise. The land is big and uh, wide and uh, fertile. So let's uh, utilize the land. Kirina and Recto invited or made a law to make a lot of Visayans go to Mindanao and take over the land and become the farmers in Mindanao. And that was in 1939 when uh, the influx of settlers began. One of their starting point was the Janga City. There, the Janga City is in southern Mindanao. And it was later renamed as General Santos City because General Santos was the uh, National Land Settlement Administration officer who would welcome the Visayan people and assign them the lands. So today, if you go to Mindanao, what's the common language there? You would notice that it's Visaya. It's a Cebuano or Ilongo. A lot of people in Visayas speak the Visayan language. Why? Because uh, they were the descendants of the Quirino uh, Recto Colonization Bill migrants. Uh, just like uh, Pacquiao. Well, he's from uh, Mindanao. And uh, Mami Junisha. What language do they speak? Bisaya. You have some other friends who's Bisaya? Uh, Duterte also speaks uh, Bisaya. Because their ancestors, probably uh, they were the first batch of settlers who benefited from the Quirino Recto colonization bill. That happened in the 1930s. Now, in the 1940s, the Americans gave us our independence. Remember? 1946, July 4. And so, finally, there is peace and independence and self-rule in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. And we became one country, one solid country. During Spanish times, or before the coming of the Spaniards, remember our analysis, we were composed of several mini-kingdoms. And then the Spaniards came and solidified the mini-kingdoms into Las Islas Filipinas, which is Luzon and Visayas. Mindanao remained independent. And then Americans came and then united the whole archipelago, Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, called as the Philippine Islands. And that's only the first time that we became one solid big nation. It's the Americans who put us together and taught us you are all belonging to one country. Spanish times, it's not like that. So much more pre-colonial times. And when the Americans left us in 1946, believe it or not, there was peace in the whole archipelago. Muslims and Christians coexisted in the South. You have neighbors who are Muslims, you have neighbors who are Bisaya. In the mountains, there were the Lumads. Nobody's fighting in Mindanao. There was peace in Mindanao and also in Visayas and Luzon. And that's uh, where we will end in part one of our long uh, lesson on the history of the uh, Bangsa Moro people. Sultanate of Sulu and the indigenous people of the Philippines. I hope I, you have absorbed what I shared to you today. Okay, so that this slide is available on Blackboard. Uh, keep on uh, reading, reviewing this, absorbing it. It has a part two which we will discuss next meeting. So this has been Sir Jet saying. Goodbye and see you around.